It is a common creationist talking point that Neanderthals were just modern humans, um, that they were just either aberrant in their physiology and anatomy, um, such that they were minorly different, but that they were ultimately simply modern humans. Um, and one of the arguments that they use for this uh, is genetic, that they we know that Neanderthals and modern Homo sapiens interbred with one another, and therefore they must have been the same species. Um, and so I want to take on uh, this claim by creationists and demonstrate that we actually have very strong genetic evidence that Neanderthals were not modern humans, and they were indeed a separate species. So first we need to start off by defining what a species is. Um, and what constitutes a species can be messy in nature, particularly when they're not in sympatry. Um, but we have a pretty good working definition for what species is, um, especially if we can observe any kind of reproduction uh, between different groups. Um, and this relies largely on Mayer's concept, and this is the biological species concept, in which he stated very strongly that this is a group of interbreeding individuals that produce fertile offspring. Um, however, um, Coyne and Orr in their book Speciation noted that this was a that there were many exceptions to this rule and that this was probably too strong of a definition to apply in most cases because we know of abundant examples in nature of persistent hybridization between parental populations. Um, however, these parental populations, despite interbreeding and apparently having, you know, fertile offspring, for whatever reason, the parental populations are maintained. They don't get swamped out by introgression. Um, and this is exactly what you would expect to happen over time if there was free gene flow between two populations of the same species. You expect that over time that they should become a rather homogeneous mixture of different uh, genotypes. However, in true species, we don't see this happen, despite the fact that, in, that introgression can occur. Um, and there's a few reason, reasons for this, um, and we'll, we'll get into that, but I, I also want to note that there are some terms that have been used, especially in the Neanderthal human introgression literature, but also in just the hybridization literature. In general, this is the concept of hybrid vigor or adaptive introgression. Um, these concepts refer to the idea that there are some alleles that are beneficial in another species that do not exist in a current species, um, and that via hybridization and introgression, you can actually get those alleles into a modern species, or not a modern, but into a, a different species, um, and then selection can, can sweep those alleles to fixation. Um, and so that most certainly occurs, and if we even have evidence that it has occurred um, in humans, but it tends to be isolated. It, it's a, a suite of alleles. It's not the whole genome. Um, and we're going to look at some simulations of what you would expect whole genome introgression or admixture to be versus merely adaptive introgression. Okay, so let's take a step back and think about uh, a hypothetical scenario in which we have two distinct species that have what we're going to call a zone of hybridization. So here we have a blue species and a red species. Uh, this is their hypothetical range. And then here in the middle where they have some overlap, this is our zone of hybridization. Now, what this insinuates is that at this region, you have free intermating between these two hybrids. Now, again, this occurs in nature and in some populations, this zone of hybridization can persist um, however, you see no back gene flow into the parental population. Sometimes you see very low levels of gene flow into the parental population, um, but we can very easily distinguish between whether this is a neutral setting, i.e. these are just separate populations, um, and whether there is actually selection against this introgression back into parental populations. Um, and the way you do this is you just note what is the rate of migration back into the parental population. If the rate of migration exactly equals the ancestry proportions that you see between these two populations, then they are just that. They are just two populations. However, if you find the amount of hybrid ancestry is much lower than the rate of backbreeding into the population, then you know that something is happening to, to prevent 
uh, hybrids from breeding with parental population. Okay, so we talked about how uh, the possibility that these parental genotypes can persist, so it, despite the face of gene flow. So let's talk about what kind of mechanisms there might be to, to prevent um, admixture or just like the neutral swamping out of these alleles. Um, so the most popular model is called the Dobzhansky-Muller model or Dobzhansky-Muller incompatibilities. Um, and this is just a simple cartoon of how that works. So you start with an ancestral genotype on the left where every individual in the population has big A and big B on their, on their chromosomes. Then this, this population becomes isolated. Uh, that's the arrows going up and down, the two isolated populations, and a new mutation occurs. So in one, the big A gets mutated into a little a, and in the other, the big B gets mutated into a little b. Um, and in this first uh, pair of circles, you can see that the big A and the big B still persist in these populations, such that these mutations are polymorphic, but over time, they become fixed. So now this separate population has only the little a's, this one has only the little b's. Now importantly, these populations require that they have little a, big b, big a, little b over time, such that a hybrid has these incompatible mixes between little a and little b that no longer, uh, or that reduce the fitness of those particular individuals. So this is a genetic incompatibility. Um, the little a and the little b. Okay, so th this is, like I said, a, a very simple model of how these kinds of incompatibilities can arise. Now, how does this interact with recombination and natural selection? So, as I stated, uh, the DMIs are loci specific, right? They occur on a specific part of the genome and it interacts with another part and that causes um, the incompatibility, okay? Now, recombination breaks up associations between loci. Um, and so what this does is it allows some hybrid ancestry to persist because those DMIs are being broken up and no longer associated with one another, okay? Furthermore, selection can then weed out those DMIs and this can preserve the parental ancestry. So this is what we've been talking about prior, uh, pri previously, in which there's persistent gene flow between these two populations, but somehow they're maintaining their parental ancestry. Well, this is the action of selection weeding out um, the minor ancestry or the hybrid ancestry uh, because there's some kind of fitness cost to that hybrid ancestry, okay? And anytime we see a signature of this, we see a signature of natural selection weeding out the minor parental ancestry, which is to say the hybrid ancestry, that is strong evidence that these are separate species, okay? Uh, under the biological species concept. So what I wanna show you here is a model uh, to kind of uh, prime our intuition of, of the data I'm gonna show you in just a minute. So in regions of low recombination in the genome, you can have, uh, or I should start with saying that the purple dots and the blue dots are the incompatibility. So for this genome, you have an incompatibility between the hybrid ancestor here and the parental ancestor here. So these, these don't jive with each other, okay? The stretches of light purple and light blue, those are the full stretches of hybrid ancestry. Uh, or major parent, minor parent is the terminology that's probably actually correct in this in this context. Um, but you can see that where the blue is and where the purple is, there's lots of loci that don't that they're not harmful to either ancestor. Okay, it's only the circle, the the blue circles. So in areas of low recombination where you don't have anything that's breaking up the associations between just like the neutral allelic background and this DMI, then over time and in generations, you just won't find that ancestry because selection just is calling out any individual that has this allelic combination, okay? And, and it does that indiscriminately because recombination is not breaking up these two associations, all right? Now consider areas of the genome that have very high re rates of recombination, okay? So you've got constant recombination that's breaking up the association between these two alleles so that you can have regions that look like this, okay? Where you just have some of the minor parent ancestry, but you don't have, it's been broken up away from where 
uh, the incompatibility is. Same thing for this ancestor on this side. It's not including this region where the incompatibility is. So over time, you would simply not find this genotype, this genotypic combination. As you can see, it's not here, but you would still find these because they don't include the, the incompatibility. Okay, and so this is how recombination can interact with natural selection to allow the persistence of some hybrid ancestry. Okay, allows, so what we would expect to see then in species that um, are interbreeding, forming hybrids, but that are our biological species and they have incompatibilities with one another, then we should expect that in low areas of recombination, we should find very little hybrid ancestry. However, in higher and higher and higher regions of recombination, we should find increased hybrid ancestry. Again, because selection um, can weed out those incompatibilities without weeding out the entire hybrid swath. Okay, that's the prediction. That's, that's what we expect to see. So what I want to do now is show you a study that did this exact thing for humans and Neanderthals. Um, and this study was done by this absolute rock star, Molly Schumer. She's um, a principal investigator at uh, Stanford. Um, I had the great pleasure of meeting Molly. She worked with um, my roommate, uh, Dan Powell, who's actually on this paper right here. Um, and his advisor, Gil Rosenthal, who is also a dear friend of mine. I spent a lot of time... Um, with him during grad school uh, and at their field station in CHAZ in Hidalgo, uh, Mexico. Um, and this particular paper um, really drives home this point that I've been trying to make, um, that natural selection is going to be interacting with the recombination rate to weed out um, hybrid ancestry in areas of low recombination. So what they did is they, they did a neutral simulation and compared it to a simulation of um, hybrid load, okay? And so under a neutral setting, note that the recombination rates down here, I should say, and that the minor parent ancestry is on the Y, and under a neutral setting, the mean is just equal to whatever the ancestry uh, gene flow admixture rate is, which in their case was 0.3, okay? And it doesn't matter where on the genome you go, it's roughly the same. Uh, because again, there's no selection against these genotypes. So if we saw something that looked like this, where you had just free recon or just free admixture with no selection acting against any region of the genome, then you might could make an argument that are these two really separate species? Or are they just um like like why would they just be freely interbreeding if they were, you know, actually separate species? Are they perhaps simply uh, isolated populations that have no incompatibilities between them. Alternatively, if you see a pattern like this, and this is their simulation where hybridization is harming uh, in some way, there's some incompatibilities that are harming um, the fitness of offspring, you expect to see this scaling, where in regions of low recombination, uh, you have lower levels of that hybrid ancestry, and then it gets greater and greater and greater as you get to higher and higher rates of recombination. Now, this is just a simulation to kind of help you understand the graphs that we're going to show. Now, remember, again, the Y is the minor parent ancestry. That's the hybrid ancestry. And then the X is the recombination rate. Okay. Now, let's look at their actual data. So first, on the far left, this is the Neanderthal ancestry in humans. Um, and note that for this one, they've removed the top 1%. Uh, the reason that they did this for this particular graph is that we have evidence of some adaptive introgression in Neanderthals, so the top 1% slightly skews it. Uh, in fact, this middle graph here is the Neanderthal ancestry without the top 1% removed. Um, but regardless of if you remove it or if you keep it, the pattern is still very much there and is strongly significant. So you can see very clearly at low rates of recombination, we have low Neanderthal hybrid ancestry, and then that begins to rise precipitously as you get further and further away from, or for, at higher and higher recombination rates. The same is true here, even with the top 1% um, remained, it just flattens out a little bit sooner. 
And then they also include um, Denisovans, and you see the same pattern. And it's actually quite a bit stronger than it is in Neanderthals, but you can see this huge jump and then eventual flattening out as you get to higher and higher recombination rates. Um, to note, all of these results were highly significant with strong positive correlation coefficients. And what that means is that there's a strong correlation between recombination rate, a strong positive correlation between recombination rate and the minor parent ancestry. All right, so in summary, the biological species should resist gene flow from heterospecifics. Um, this means that just because they interbreed, they can still be separate species if the parental populations are resistant to gene flow. All right, they're not allowing high levels of admixture to occur. Uh, genetic incompatibilities arise between isolated populations that can reduce hybrid fitness. This is the DMIs we talked about. And then regions of high recombination can break up the associations between these DMIs and can allow hybrid ancestry to persist. A natural selection purges these incompatibilities in low recombination regions, such that you expect to not find any hybrid ancestry there or very little. And finally, that this pattern is exactly what we just saw uh, for both Neanderthal as well as Denisovan ancestry. Again, if this were the case, if humans and Neanderthals were the same species, then you do not expect to see this pattern. You would expect to see a pattern of, of completely uh, random association between the recombination rate and the minor parent ancestry. But that's not what we see. We see a strong, significant, positive correlation between the recombination rate and the amount of hybrid ancestry. Uh, so to me, that is, that is lead pipe evidence that Neanderthals and humans were not the same species. There was selection acting uh, against hybrids such that we lose hybrid ancestry at low recombination regions. Um, I should note that you don't see this pattern for any other modern human pair. Uh, no modern human uh, would produce this pattern of ancestry with their uh, forward into time. Uh, there's no selection, there's no DMIs, there's nothing like that between any modern humans. Okay, And this is how we know that all modern humans are a single species, but that humans and Neanderthals were not. Uh, so thank you for your time. I hope you found this informative. If you have any questions or would like to see any follow-ups on this work, there are some some really cool follow-up papers on this. Let me know um, and I can drop them in the comments. Um, and with that, hope you have a great day and thanks for being here.